My name is David Murray. I'm the Associate Director for Prevention here at NIH and the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 2022 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture in Epidemiology. The Gordon Lecture is awarded each year to a scientist who's made major contributions to research or training in the field of epidemiology or in the conduct of clinical trials. The speaker selection is coordinated by the Office of Disease Prevention, and this is the 27th year that the ODP has sponsored the Gordon Lecture. The Gordon Lecture Award was established in tribute to Robert S. Gordon Jr. for his dedication to the field of epidemiology and his distinguished service to NIH. Over the course of 30 years, Dr. Gordon served in numerous senior leadership positions, including special assistant to the director and chief advisor for clinical practice and research. Dr. Gordon was an early organizer of efforts to address the emerging problem of HIV AIDS, and he became a key coordinator of AIDS research at NIH. Today's speaker is Dr. Rena Wing. Dr. Wing is well known for her research on behavioral treatment of obesity, and particularly its application in type 2 diabetes. She has published hundreds of peer-reviewed articles on these topics. Currently, she's the principal investigator on the Diabetes Prevention Program and has developed the lifestyle intervention being used in all the centers in that study. Dr. Wing is a member of the Council of, for the National Institute for Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases uh, and serves on the NIDDK Task Force on the Prevention and Treatment of Obesity. Her presentation is entitled, Should Older Adults with Diabetes and Obesity Lose Weight? Please join me in welcoming the 2022 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Rena Wing. Thank you, David. That was a very nice introduction. I want to thank Dr. Murray and the Office of Disease Prevention for selecting me to give this Gordon Lecture in Epidemiology for the year 2022. I'll be using data from the Look Ahead study to address the question of whether older adults with diabetes and obesity should lose weight. For the past 22 years, that's almost a quarter of a century, I've had the opportunity to be PI of one of the sites of Look Ahead and chairman of the Look Ahead trial. So it's a great privilege to me today to have this chance to present to you the results from this key study. It takes a village really to implement a study such as this. So if I were to make a list of all the people involved in Look Ahead trial, we would never get to any of my other slides. So what I want to do is just acknowledge the groups of people who've been involved in this study. So it includes the PI and the co-investigators at each of the 16 sites, the program coordinators who are often nurses or interventionists at each of the sites who are really responsible for running the study, the executive committee that met on phone calls every week for 22 years, NIH that was the primary sponsor of this trial, and particularly NIDDK who provided most of the funding for the study but I've also shown some of the other groups that were involved in funding this research. The CDC and other funding agencies were involved. And in particular, I want to thank the participants in the trial because the study could not have been done without them and their loyal participation for 22 years. What I want to do is first cover the background to look ahead. Then I'll talk about the design of the trial, the primary outcome and some of the possible explanations for those results. I'll then deal with other outcomes of Look Ahead and come to conclusions and implications. Excuse me. Now, weight loss is recommended for overweight and obese adults, especially for those with type 2 diabetes. However, observational studies have raised concerns about the effects of weight loss on mortality in older adults. In fact, in some of these studies, weight loss not only didn't improve mortality, it actually worsened mortality. These negative effects persisted even after controlling for something such as smoking or illnesses such as cancer. However, observational studies cannot really distinguish intentional versus unintentional weight loss. The best way to do that is through a clinical trial in which some people are randomly assigned to lose weight intentionally and the others are followed in a control group or in some other um, group over time. Now, prior to doing Look Ahead, there had been also many small short-term clinical trials, which suggested that intentional weight loss 
has positive effects on glycemic control and CBD risk factors. And in fact, there was a meta-analysis of these small studies that had raised the suggestion that there might be a positive effect on, on mortality as well. It was clear though that answering the question would require a large long-term randomized trial of intentional weight loss in older adults. Based on the strong incidence of obesity and diabetes and concerns regarding the benefits of weight loss, NIH decided that a clinical trial was needed on this topic and that it should be done in type two diabetics with overweight and obesity. Now, I don't want you to have the feeling that Look Ahead just suddenly came to pass. It actually started in the year 1999 or 2000, but the foundation for the trial had been laid many years before. In the 1980s and 90s, there'd been many small trials testing components of intensive lifestyle intervention. For example, comparing diet versus diet plus exercise or studies showing the benefits of including meal replacement products as part of the dietary prescription. The Diabetes Prevention Program, another large randomized trial funded by NIDDK, was critical in paving the way for look ahead. This study showed that DPP, excuse me, showed that lifestyle interventions can be standardized and produce weight loss in diverse populations, including in minority groups. And perhaps most importantly, that modest weight losses can produce clinically significant changes in health. I'd like to illustrate that with a few slides from the Diabetes Prevention Program. The Diabetes Prevention Program involved 3,000 individuals with pre-diabetes, so are at risk, for, high risk for developing diabetes. These individuals were randomly assigned to lifestyle metformin, which is a drug that's used to treat diabetes, or to placebo. I was the PI of the Lifestyle Resource Corps. We designed the intervention, trained the interventionists, and we ensured fidelity of the intervention across the sites. I believe that the lifestyle intervention goals were modest. The goal was for each person to lose 7% of their body weight which for somebody starting off the study at 200 pounds was just about a seven kilogram or 400, uh, excuse me, a seven kilogram or 14 pound weight loss. The calorie goal to achieve that was put at 1200 to 1800 calories a day with less than 25% fat. And participants were gradually encouraged to increase their exercise till they were doing 175 minutes per week of brisk activity. This slide shows the weight changes that were achieved in the diabetes prevention program. As you can see, at six months, participants had lost about seven kilograms or 7% of their body weight, so right on target. They maintained that at one year and then gradually regained some weight over time. However, throughout the four years, the weight changes in the lifestyle arm were significantly better than those in placebo. However, as I emphasized before, these weight losses, I believe, are quite modest, and yet they had a very robust effect on the incidence of diabetes. So at the very beginning of the trial, shown on the left of this slide, you can see that nobody had diabetes because they were all at risk for developing it, but none of them had it yet. Then each six months, an oral glucose tolerance test was conducted to determine who all had converted to actually having diabetes. And as you can see here, by the end of the four years, about 40% of the placebo participants had developed diabetes compared to about 30% in metformin or 20% in lifestyle intervention. So intensive lifestyle intervention reduced the risk of developing diabetes by 58% and was nearly twice as effective as the drug metformin. So I believe that DPP really helped us establish that we can produce weight loss in a large trial such as this, and that even a modest weight loss of 14 pounds can have a large impact on health. I believe that that's what led NIH to be confident that they could launch the Look Ahead trial, in which we were trying to ask the question of whether lifestyle intervention could reduce the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality 
in those who already had type 2 diabetes. We started recruitment for this study in the year 2000 and recruited gradually over the next couple of years. All participants were randomly assigned to either intensive lifestyle intervention, which I'll describe in a moment, or to diabetes support and education, which was the control or comparison condition. And the primary outcome was a composite measure of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Now the 5,145 participants who entered this trial came from 16 different clinical sites throughout the United States. They all had type two diabetes with overweight and obesity. They were aged 45 to 76 with a mean of 59 years. 37% were from minority ethnic racial groups. That was very important to us because diabetes disproportionately affects minority groups. So we wanted our study to have population that was similar to the population affected by diabetes. And in addition, they had to pass a maximum CBT stress test. Now these participants were randomly assigned, as I said, to either diabetes support and education, which was the control group, or to intensive lifestyle intervention. The control group attended three to four educational sessions per year related to diet, exercise, or social support. The intervention group was really a very intensive intervention. They received weekly counseling for the first year, and they had a goal of losing 10% of their weight, so somewhat higher goal than we had in DPP. They were to accomplish that by eating a lower calorie uh, diet, and they used meal replacement products, which as I said, had been shown to improve weight losses. And they gradually were encouraged to increase their exercise to 175 minutes per week of physical activity. As in DPP, in Look Ahead, the intervention was strongly behavioral, including strategies such as goal setting and self-monitoring. In years two to four, we reduced the amount of contact, but they still had monthly contact. And in years five on, we kept it at quarterly contact. But throughout years two to the end of the study, they had refresher sessions as needed to encourage them to stay on track with their diet and exercise. The intervention continued through the year 2012. So that means for nine to 11 years, each participant was receiving intervention. Now in designing this study, we made several design decisions, which I think are very important for you to think about in terms of, as well, I'll go on to in terms of the outcomes that we achieved. One decision we made was to enrich the sample with participants with CVD history in order to increase the power of the study. This is typically done in CVD studies. And so 14% of our participants had a CVD history. We also decided ahead that participants and their physicians were to be given feedback on their annual blood work and that their medication adjustments were to be made by their own physicians, not by the study trial. And we also decided ahead that ILI would decrease in intensity over time, as I just showed you. The goal of ILI was to lose weight, as I said, a 10% weight loss, and to increase physical activity. This slide shows we achieved our weight loss goals. Initially, the weight loss was 8.5% at year one. Not quite the 10%, but clearly an excellent weight loss and even greater than we achieved in DPP. Over time, there was some regain but as you can see here, ILI, which is shown in blue, had better weight losses than DSC, which is shown in red throughout the entire trial. By the way, I'll keep that color scheme throughout all my slides so that hopefully you'll be able to follow them over time. So the next slide shows the changes in cardiovascular fitness that we achieved. Fitness was assessed with submaximal tests. And this, uh, these were conducted at years one, two, and four. And as you can see here, the fitness greatly improved in ILI, much more so than in DSC. Again, though, the greatest increase was at year one and gradually decreased over time. Although we did not assess fitness beyond year four, we did find that physical function measures, such as gait speed, remained faster in ILI throughout the trial. 
This next slide shows you the improvements in hemoglobin A1C. And again, they really parallel the weight losses that I showed you a minute ago, where again, ILI has a very big improvement at initially, less improvement over time, but remains significantly different than DSE throughout. Now, having achieved our weight losses and our hemoglobin A1C improvements and our fitness changes, we expected or hoped that our cumulative hazard ratio for a primary outcome would be different, that ILI might have a lower incidence of um, problems than DSE. However, the cumulative incidence for fatal and non-fatal MIR strokes or hospitalized angi angina, which was our primary outcome, showed no differences as seen here. I can't imagine two more parallel lines, more similar lines for DSE and ILI over the 10 years. The same was true for all of the secondary CVD composite outcomes. To some, this was a surprising or disappointing finding, leading to several different explanations for these results. Probably the central most appropriate interpretation is that weight loss does not affect CVD risk in overweight adults with diabetes. However, however, others have sought other explanations. For example, some have said the sample was too sick. They had CVD. Others have said the sample was too healthy because they had to pass a treadmill test. Others have said, well, there was better risk factor management over time and that may have obscured the effect of weight loss. Another possibility is that the weight losses were not large enough or that those who did not lose weight may have blunted any positive effects of weight loss. Some have questioned whether the weight losses achieved by ILI can be sufficient. They point to the fact that from bariatric surgery, where weight losses are much bigger, you ha they have been able to show that there were decreases in the CVD incidence. So in look ahead, we cannot test any of these hypotheses or these possibility explanations, but we can look at post hoc data analysis that might give us some glimpse of what might've been happening in our trial. But keep in mind, we can't randomize people to either um, have a larger weight loss or not as large a weight loss. So let's look at each of these proposed explanations for a minute. One that I'm going to focus on was that the sample might have been too sick. Um, now, in terms of this hypothesis, it's very interesting to divide the groups into those with a CVD history and those without at baseline. So if you look at the group without a CVD history, it includes, um, I'm sorry, the next slide. This is the group without a CVD history. And that included um, all 86% of our sample had no CVD history. And you can see there that there was a slightly but non significantly lower risk of the primary outcome in ILI than in DSC in those with no cardiovascular disease history. Hazard ratio of 0.86 but it was a non-significant effect. Now over here in the CVD history group, there was also a non-significant effect, but it's in the opposite direction. 1.13 hazard ratio, leading to a non-significant interaction, but very close to significant. You can see here also that our expectation that people with CVD history would have a greater risk of heart disease outcomes than those with, without, excuse me, that those with the history would have a greater risk than those without a history. And sure enough, we found that. But it does suggest to us that if we had done our intervention with people who did not have CVD at the beginning, we might have achieved a different effect. Now, more recently, there's been another study of ours, a post hoc explanation that also suggests a significant benefit on CVD incidence in those who are healthiest. Here though, instead of using CVD history, 
we use the deficit accumulation model to look at the total number of health deficits a person had at baseline. We divided people into three different tiers according to the number of health problems they had at baseline. We used the middle tertile as our reference group. And as you can see here, those people in the lowest tertile who had the fewest health problems at baseline actually showed a significant reduction in their hazard ratio for the primary CVD outcome. In contrast, in those who were the sickest at baseline, there was a non-significant worsening in their outcomes. So again, I'll suggest that perhaps intervening earlier is going to be helpful. It's a point I'll keep making throughout the trial, throughout my slides today. So another proposed explanation has been that improving risk factor management improved the health of the control group. Here you can see the use of medication among the DSE patients shown in red again, and ILI in blue. And as you see at every slide at every time point, there is greater use of antihypertensives, statins, and insulin in the control group than there was in the intervention group. This slide also shows that medical care was changing dramatically over the course of the study, likely reducing the number of CVD events and statistical power, and also affecting our results. You can see antihypertensive use going up, statin use going up a lot, insulin use going up a lot. The higher use of statins in DSC led to lower levels of LDL in DSC than in ILI as shown here. So perhaps one explanation for our results is that we had two different mechanisms operating for the two different arms. In ILI, perhaps it was weight loss and the lifestyle intervention that was improving our risk of heart disease. But in DSC, it might have been the lower LDL levels that was leading to the improvements. So another explanation that's been proposed is the, um, that the weight losses were not large enough or that those who did not lose weight blunted the effect of weight loss. To address this hypothesis, we conducted a, um, a secondary analysis and we showed the results that I'm gonna talk about here. Using either the diabetes support and education group as a whole, or those in ILI who gained weight or remained weight staple, as I'm showing you here, we found a significant reduction in the primary outcome, but only for those individuals who lost 10% or more of their body weight. The right-hand bar. This group, had a significant reduction in their, all, their risk of primary outcome relative to here, the gainers or the stable. This analysis is interesting and it suggests that larger weight losses may have, needed, may have been needed to produce a greater effect or that we needed a greater number of participants losing 10%. But this is a post hoc analysis, not a randomized comparison. So although we included covariates in our analyses, those individuals who lost more weight shown in the right bar may have differed from those who were gaining or weight stable in many different ways that we couldn't know about or didn't control for. Due to the lack of significant differences in the primary outcome and a futility analysis, NIH decided to stop all of the interventions in the year 2012, but continued look ahead as an observational study this provided us with a wonderful opportunity to examine the effect of the first 10 years of intervention on other health outcomes related to diabetes and obesity. It also provided an opportunity for us to add new measures relevant to aging. The Look Ahead trial is still ongoing. It's now funded by NIA and it's being done entirely by phone contact with our participants. But I did want to advise you and let you know that it is ongoing. Now, although the primary outcome of CVD was not significant, intensive lifestyle intervention was found to have many positive effects on many other outcomes. I've selected just a few on this list here 
And I'm even going to pick a fewer, a smaller number of those to talk about in these next few slides. So one thing that has been shown is that the, there was an association between being an intensive lifestyle intervention and the possibility of remission of type two diabetes. Now remission was defined as not needing diabetes medications and still having normal glucose or glucose levels in the non-diabetic range. ILI had greater prevalence of remission in years one, two, three, and four as shown here. The greatest benefits were in year one and also the greatest benefits were in those who were healthiest at baseline. Another positive effect was on the incidence of nephropathy. So one of the microvascular complications of diabetes was also markedly reduced by our lifestyle intervention. As seen here, the control group in blue has a much higher risk of developing this high risk coronary, uh, excuse me, chronic kidney disease relative to our intensive lifestyle intervention. I think this is one of the other interesting findings of Look Ahead because it deals really with treatment, not just prevention of something, but it deals with treatment of an ongoing problem, in this case, sleep apnea. In this subgroup of 264 adults with type two diabetes and previously diagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, we found that an intensive lifestyle intervention in reduced the incidence of diabetes, of I'm sorry, of OSA. And it was far greater reduction in the intervention group than in the control group. This slide shows you the incidence, uh, the reduction, excuse me, in obstructive sleep apnea in these patients at year four. And you can see here the marked number of people with improved OSA in ILI versus DSC. If you actually look at remission rates, at four years, ILI had 20.7% of their participants no longer had obstructive sleep apnea compared to only 4% in the control group. Now I'd like to just look at one other public health kind of outcome. So I hope I've covered some prevention outcomes, some treatment outcomes. Now I just wanted to look at one public health one, which is that ILI reduced healthcare costs. It was a 15% reduction in the number of days in the hospital a 5% reduction in medication costs, leading to a savings of $5,280 per person over the 10 years. However, the cost of offering ILI exceeded that of the cost of DSC. So ILI cost $1,500 per participant per year versus only $122 per participant per year for DSC when averaged over the 10 years. In terms of cost effectiveness, our outcomes really depended on which measure of health utilities we utilized. Now, I don't want you to have the idea that everything was positive from ILI, although I would argue that most of them were, but there were some negative effects of ILI on health, particularly in terms of loss of lean body mass and an increased risk of fractures. We completed DEXA measures on a subset of participants at baseline years one, four, eight, and at the end of the trial. As participants lost weight at year one, they had marked improvements in both their lean fat mass and their lean mass. Here, by the way, the DSC group is shown in the solid line and the ILI in the dotted line. But as ILI gradually regained weight between years one and four, or years one and eight even, you can see that their fat mass increased but their lean mass did not increase. We're not sure what the health consequences of this will be, but one possibility is it would increase the risk of fractures in ILI relative to DSC. There were no differences in the incidence of total fractures. However, as shown here, there were differences in the cumulative incidence of frailty fractures which are fractures of the hip, pelvis, upper arm, or shoulder. 
these were greater in females than in males, and within each gender were greater in the intervention group than in the control group. So this is a concern to us um, because obviously you do not want to be, have people having frailty fractures, um, and this may have been related to their loss of lean mass. Now, I also want to emphasize the fact that there were no significant effects of ILI on health for several very key health problems. I've already pointed out that for our primary outcome of CVD, there were no effects. I also want to tell you that there were no effects for cancer, cognitive function, or cognitive impairment and dementia. And I'll show you some examples of this on the next slides. This slide looks at the risk of cancer. And you can see here, none of the p-values are significant. No differences, statistically significant differences between DSE and ILI for cancer risk. There's a trend for um, a positive effect in obesity-related cancers, but it's just a p of 0.10. No differences, again, in cancer mortality. We also had no effects on cognitive function, but we did have um, positive effects on um, MRI uh, brain structure with positive benefits in ILI versus DSC. However, we have not found any effects thus far on cognitive impairment, um, mild clinical cognitive impairment or dementia. And this may be because our rates of both of these problems has been so low thus far. So our adjudicated MCI was only 6.4% in both ILI and DSC. An adjudicated dementia was only 1.8 in both ILI and DSC. So hopefully that's one of the reasons that we'll be able to continue with um, NIA funding to look at these cognitive impairments over time. Again, though there were significant interactions by baseline BMI and CVD history. Now, most recently we have added another non-significant effect of ILI on health. It's in terms of overall mortality. We adjudicated mortality and its causes over the entire study. And we've just published these results in a very recent issue of Diabetes Care. This slide shows the total mortality over the entire study during the intervention, the transition, and the post-intervention phases. Over this entire period, the hazard ratio was 0.92. So there was an 8% reduction in all cause mortality for ILI versus DSC, but this was not significant, a P of 0.16. So ILI neither improved nor worsened all cause mortality relative to DSC. Here, I've shown you the adjudicated primary causes of death. There were no differences in cancer risk, CVD, or other. However, one of the things I think that's interesting in this slide is that cancer and other are higher adjudicated primary causes of death than CVD in this population. Again, we've conducted a post hoc analysis comparing all cause mortality and ILI according to the magnitude of their weight losses compared to DSC as a whole. We show that those individuals who had the biggest weight losses at one year, so that's a weight loss of 10% or more, had less mortality over the subsequent period of the study. So between years two and the end of the trial in ILI versus DSC. In contrast, those individuals who had the least weight loss or actually gained had a sign almost significant worsening in their mortality, but not quite significant, 0.088. So again, this is a post hoc analysis, but it's very interesting because it goes along with some of our other post hoc analyses, suggesting that those individuals who lost the most weight in ILI, 10% or more, did show beneficial effects relative to DSE as a whole. And that those individuals who gained weight may have had a slight worsening in their risk.
Now, finally, in another recent manuscript that we published in Diabetes Care, we examined what happened with weight over the full course of look ahead. So now looking at weight changes, particularly during the post-intervention period. As you can see here, both ILI and DSC lost weight over the last six to 10 years of the study. We used trajectory analyses to determine if there were different patterns of weight changes after the end of intervention. This analysis identified four different trajectories, gainers, a stable group, a steady loss group, and a steep loss group. The steep loss group included only 10% of the participants, but I wanna point out how steep their weight losses were. On average, these individuals lost almost 20% of their body weight over the eight years from year eight to 16. That's far greater than we achieved with our ILI program during the original intervention. We also found that these steep losers, these 10% of the group, had an increased risk of mortality. 30% of these individuals passed away versus 10 to 19% in our other three groups. They were also older, sicker, and they reported less use of healthy weight loss strategies. So these data suggest to us that perhaps their weight losses were unintentional, not intentional. Again, suggesting that unintentional weight loss may have a negative effect on health, even if intentional weight loss is helpful. So in conclusion, ILI had no effect on several important health problems, including the primary outcome of CBD, it also had no effect on cancer, cognition, or mortality. However, ILI has had a positive effect on many health issues, including diabetes remission, chronic kidney disease, sleep apnea, and others that I didn't even discuss. These positive effects were often greatest at year one and diminished over time. There was heterogeneity in geneity in the response to ILI relative to DSC. ILI had a positive impact in those who were healthiest at baseline and in those who lost greater than 10% of their body weight at one year. So now I wanna to return to my original question. Should older adults with diabetes and obesity be encouraged to lose weight? My answer, and I wanna, point out that this is my answer, not everyone will agree, is yes, I think they should be encouraged. Because given the many positive outcomes of weight loss in these older, I believe that continuing to recommend weight loss is appropriate. However, I think we need to be recommending intentional weight loss at appropriate rates. And that older, sicker patients who are losing weight too rapidly should raise our concerns. Now, for more information about these studies or for more information about um, our trial, look ahead. I would encourage you to look at this recent article I've published in Obesity, which really summarized many of the findings from the look ahead randomized trial and includes all the data I was talking about today and all the references for what I was talking about today. There's also the www.lookaheadtrial.org website, which includes the protocol for the different phases of look ahead and the full bibliography. And finally, we've been putting all of our data gradually on the NIDDK website on the repository, and we've been sending blood samples to the NIDDK repository. So those will all be available to investigators within Look Ahead or outside of Look Ahead who want to propose new uses of our data, new projects, or new uses of our samples. So for example, we had a GWAS of all our participants I did not go into any of the genetic analyses in my findings today, but they are all available if you want to go to this repository. So I just wanna end by thanking you all and particularly thanking the Office of Disease Prevention for suggesting me as a speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wing, very much uh, for a, a fascinating presentation.
Uh, lots of questions to consider, uh, and we have a little time uh, to do that. Uh, so let me start. Um, why would observational studies show higher mortality and weight loss where a trial like Look Ahead uh, showed uh, many health benefits from weight loss? I, I believe that's really because of the problem of distinguishing intentional versus unintentional weight loss. So in an observational study, you have a lot of people who are losing weight, but you don't know why or how. In a clinical trial, what you've done is taken half the people and randomly assigned them to intentionally lose weight. You've taught them healthy strategies to do it, and you've followed them over time. So I believe that that's the difference. It's in the methodology and the design of those two types of studies. Thank you. Um, uh, I should have said this at the uh, beginning of the question and answer period, but let me do it now. Um, the code for continuing medical education credits is 37947. So those of you who are interested in that, 37947. Now, returning to questions. Uh, as some people have suggested that we don't need to do these large, expensive clinical trials anymore, uh, that we can instead use sophisticated causal modeling techniques with far less expensive observational data to answer these questions. <clears throat> What's your view? Well, I've heard that often talked about with EMR data. So for example, taking a group of people and then following them through EMR data. But I would really question that. First of all, I would question how you're ever going to distinguish those people who are losing weight intentionally and using healthy strategies versus those weight, people who are losing weight unintentionally because they're already ill, okay? So you can try to do that by saying, okay, let's leave out anybody who's a smoker. Let's leave out anybody who has cancer in the first two or three years and look at their mortality subsequent. That's what they've done in observational studies before. But I think those are all still open to criticism because they really can't distinguish the two, intentional versus unintentional weight loss. Okay. Uh, Look Ahead did a great job in recruiting uh, minority participants. 37% uh, in the early 2000s is much better than a lot of other studies that were underway at the same time. How did you manage that? Oh, that was a lot of work, but it was great. Uh, we achieved it. First of all, our sites were selected to be all over the United States. So we had a site in Texas that was um, recruiting. We had a site in Baltimore that was able to recruit a lot of African-Americans. We had a site in LA um, that was able to recruit a lot of Hispanics and actually uh, translate a lot of the material into Spanish for these participants. Um, so, and New York had a site. So by putting sites in different centers around the country, we're able to recruit different minority groups. Plus in addition, I mean, that was a real goal in the study. So everybody was encouraged to try very hard to recruit those minority groups. Uh, it, it clearly worked. So I, I, should have, I should have also mentioned that we also had sites with the um, Indian tribes and that the um, Indian Health Service also helped fund it through the study. Great. Uh, Look Ahead had a target of 175 minutes of physical activity. What kind of physical activity uh, qualified or counted uh, towards that 175 minutes? Right. Um, I should point out it's 175 minutes per week. Okay. So it's about 35 minutes each day, you know, five, five days a week. Um, and what, they, what really counts is something equivalent to brisk walking. And that's what most of our participants did. Keep in mind, our participants were 60 years old when they started the study. So now on average, they're in their 80s. Um, so brisk walking is an appropriate type of exercise as people are aging. They don't need any equipment. They don't need any special um, programs or anything to do brisk walking. So that's what we typically encourage. That's what we encouraged in DPP. And that's what we encouraged in Look Ahead too. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a participant's physician could change their medications during the trial. Did that apply to metformin in, in DPP? Uh, I realize that's, a, that's not Look Ahead, but uh, that was DPP. Was that possible there or, and, and more generally in look ahead, how did changes in medications, how were those monitored and, and dealt with in the analysis? I wanna answer the look ahead one because I can't quite remember all the details of the DPP study. 
Okay. But in Look Ahead, I can tell you what happened. In Look Ahead, we had a very standard algorithm for modifications in their diabetes medication during the first period of intensive lifestyle intervention. So for example, if you have a person on insulin and they're gonna to start to lose weight rapidly, or hopefully not too rapidly, but appropriately, but they are gonna lose weight quickly at the beginning. You don't want them to stay on that same dose of insulin because they'll have too much hypoglycemia. So we had a very set algorithm as to how much we should cut back their insulin. And we monitored their blood sugar and we adjusted their medications. So that was the only part of the trial where we as a trial were doing anything with medications. Okay. Throughout the rest of the trial, we felt that it was more appropriate for the participant's own physician to be making all other adjustments in their medications. So that included their antihypertensives, their statins, or any insulin or any other medications for diabetes over time. That was done in part for cost reasons, because it would have been very expensive if we had taken on all the medical management of 5,000 individuals. Plus, we felt that that was more the way that it should be done in a clinical trial such as this. Now, that's a question that can come back and haunt us a little bit now, and is something that we can certainly discuss if people would like. Um, <clears throat> what were the benefits of the intervention in different uh, racial groups? I'm, I'm trying to remember, you, you had uh, good representation of uh, minority groups, but I don't recall results in your presentation by uh, race or ethnicity. I didn't actually present any because most of our results did not differ by race, ethnicity. Um, a few of them did, but most of our results did not. Um, so I have not covered those, but they are covered, I think, to some extent more in my review paper and certainly by going back and checking each of those references, depending on which outcome you're most interested in. Well, I, I think it's actually a very good outcome that you found uh, few, if any, differences among uh, racial or ethnic groups in the effect of the intervention. It means it's quite generalizable. The, it works for everybody. One of the things that was very interesting was we found slight differences in weight losses initially, as is often found, with African-Americans losing less weight than Caucasians, whites. But over time, the, everybody came together so that over time, you don't see big differences in the weight loss outcomes. So I think that was one of the interesting findings. Has anyone proposed that the rebound observed in weight gain and or weight loss and also physical activity exerted a negative effect on the primary outcomes for the study? I certainly agree with that. That could certainly be part of what is happening because we've you know, looked at, I mean, I've shown you what happened with our weight losses and our fitness. We got our best effects at year one with gradually diminishing effects. And towards the end of the study, both groups were losing weight. Yeah. So all of those differences may have affected our outcomes, but we have not done analyses looking at specifically you know, weight loss or regain during specific periods of time. Lots of data for anybody who would like to analyze it. Well, uh, that's a good segue to the next question. You indicated that Look Ahead is continuing, uh, even 22 years after it began. Uh, what's the future of the study? Well, the study, as I said, is now being done entirely by phone calls from the coordinating center. So we originally had 16 sites. But at this point in time, we've converted it to just the coordinating center calling all our participants. Okay. And we've went from originally having yearly visits with each patient to then during the observational period, having every other year visits with the patients to now doing it entirely by phone. And that's partially because as these patients have aged, it's much, much more difficult to get them into the clinic. It's much more dangerous for them to try to arrive at the clinic for us to get them onto an exam table, et cetera, et cetera. So for many reasons, we moved the whole study to be a phone contact study. The, we will be following though some of the key outcomes of aging. So for example, cognitive function will be one of the very important outcomes with adjudication again of dementia and mild cognitive impairment. We're also following other problems that are related to older individuals. So for example, depression, quality of life, um, sleep problems. There's a whole big ancillary study on sleep that's being conducted. Um, 
And then we're also working with um, Dr. Peter Huckfeld at the University of Minnesota, who is accessing the Medicare databases and will be able to look at health costs and health savings over the, cost of, over the course of look ahead using the Medicare databases. So it sounds like there's lots of opportunity for, for new work. Uh, with, the, with the transition to this telephone uh, operation, it raises questions about relying on self-report data versus data directly collected on behalf of the study. That, that would apply to some variables, perhaps like weight or, or height. It might not apply to some other variables. I'm not sure how you measure uh, uh, cognitive functioning over the phone, um, but perhaps you could enlighten us. Sure. There are very good standardized valid ways to measure cognitive function over the phone. So you can administer many of these cognitive function tests um, with validated measures over the phone with older individuals. It's being done in other trials at the moment. We'll be adopting their same procedures in our trial. Now, measuring weight is more difficult. So at the moment, we are not doing anything to make certain that our results are reliable for weight or valid for weight. Um, we are using self-report. However, that's been an area where many of us have talked about doing an ancillary study. We could either provide scales with you know, remote capabilities so that they could, um, when the person got on the scale, we could see their weight, or at least having people take pictures of themselves as they're weighing them, their self. So I, I would what, vote for the Bluetooth technology. Yes, well, it's yeah. better if we can afford it. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you might be able to do that in the subsequent. Uh, right. Exactly, yeah. what we're hoping. So um, the study is still ongoing, so it's lots of opportunities for people <laughs> to get involved in the study, either, as I said, looking at some of our data, looking at some of our blood work, or proposing ancillary studies. We'd still be very open to ancillary studies going on at this time. It, I would think that one of the biggest frustrations for you and the other investigators was the, the rebound after the first year. You had such a great effect in the first year. And then uh, the effect, at least for weight and for physical activity, declined, not quite back to baseline levels, but certainly back in that direction. You know, wh what what can we do in future studies to 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 try to prevent that rebound? Because, gosh, wouldn't it be fun to see what the effect of this intervention was if you could hold that? I totally agree with you. I have been working on that problem for years and years and years way beyond the 22 years I've been involved in look at, I've been working on that problem. We don't know what we can do. Um, so some people have suggested that if we edit a medication, it might help. Or, you know, what, I mean, there's different approaches that we could possibly use. Um, we could have uh, tried more aggressive approaches to weight loss uh, or having people have different approaches. So ours was a calorie-based diet. Maybe over time we could have gone to a carbohydrate restricted diet, you know, different Changing, changing the type of diet might help with variety. But I think all of those are gonna still show this, what I like to call a check mark type of pattern where you get your best results initially and then they gradually regain weight yeah. over time. So yeah. that's a check mark that unfortunately has characterized every behavioral weight loss study that I know of. And only a few of the drug studies have not had that check mark study yeah. part yeah. two. It's a challenge. So um, uh, this study and, and others have shown us that lifestyle changes can have huge positive effects. Um, how, um, not just on health, but on, on cost of healthcare. How do we educate society about that uh, when uh, people are constantly bombarded with contrary messages over um, social and other media? That's a very interesting question. I think it's really a provocative one, um, particularly at this moment, because there's a lot of emphasis right now on um, not emphasizing weight loss, that we should not be you know, focusing on weight, we should be focusing only on health outcomes. However, if you talk to most patients, they really do want to lose weight, not only show improvements in their diabetes or their heart disease, they want to also show it on the scale or in their clothes. Um, so we're in a little bit of a conundrum of how we do this, how we emphasize both weight loss and health all at the same time. Um, and I think many of us are putting our heads together and thinking about how do we best do that 
for our patients. Um, as a closing question, uh, I would ask what advice you would give to a young investigator, a postdoc, a graduate student, who's thinking about a career focused on health and, and uh, weight, uh, what, are, what are the questions that are important to consider over the next five to 10 years? And would you discourage someone? Would you encourage them? Uh, what, what advice would you offer? Uh, I think that's a great question. I would strongly encourage them because I think this is still a burning problem in our country. I mean, it's so prominent. It's so much on everybody's mind. Um, and we still don't know what to do. I think, as you pointed out, that fact that there is so much regain is a problem. And that's one that we have to work on and try to solve. But as of yet, I don't believe we've cracked that. Um, I would also argue that there's so many questions that could still be tackled. Like, why is weight loss so effective for some people? Why are some people able to come into the same program and lose weight and others cannot? Okay. We know that on day one, some people, you know, if I talk to a group of patients about to start a program, I can tell them ahead that some of you are going to do great, some of you are going to do terribly, but I can't for the life of me tell you who's who. Okay, nothing we have been able to figure out in terms of behavioral, psychological, genetic predictors really has told us the answer to that. There's got to be some way to figure out ahead who is going to lose weight on this particular program and who is not. And then be able to tell participants that this would be a good program for you or not a good program for you. We can't do that. Okay. Years and years ago, when I was first starting my own career in research on obesity, a gentleman came up to me and, um, who said to me, he was studying drugs. And he said to me, Rena, we know that we're going to be on the cusp of getting drugs. We just want you to do the phenotypes. Because if you tell us who you've got, we'll be able to give you a drug that matches that person. So if you have a person who's got, you know, overeating problems, we'll give you that drug. And if they've got a yeah. low metabolic rate, we'll give you a different drug. Okay. Well, I'm still waiting for those <laughs> drugs. And I'm still waiting for those answers. We mm -hmm. haven't had them yet. Yeah. So meanwhile, I would encourage anybody who wants to, to keep working on this problem and working on both medications, drugs, surgery, and behavioral approaches to it. Great. I, I think that's, that's terrific advice. And uh, Dr. Wing, I wanna thank you very much for a terrific presentation, for a great conversation here at the end, uh, dealing with many of the questions that came in from our audience. And I wanna thank everybody for joining uh, in today's Gordon Lecture and particularly Dr. Rena Wing. Thank you.